Okay, well, we always start with a prayer, and Reverend Reynolds is our chaplain. So, Reverend Reynolds, please get us started, and then we'll begin our program. Dear Father God, Lord God, you are greater than any problem we would ever have. You are magnificent. You are wonderful. Lord, we look up and see the billions of stars you created, and we praise you. We look around and see the billions of people you created in your image, uniquely, fearfully, wonderfully made, and we praise you. Lord, wrap us in your spirit and unite us in one family made in the image of God. Thank you for loving us first in your love for the whole world. You sent your son to save us. Dear Lord, we pray tonight for peace that somehow all of us who are made in your image can get along. We pray for forgiveness. American sins are great. And we wonder, can we really expect God to bless America if we won't bless God? We pray for love, not hate. We pray for the end to violence of, of every kind. We pray for this meeting, oh God, that the ideas expressed here will not just be good ideas, but they will be God ideas. We pray that all of us can be a blessing, that we can continue to help others, that we can bind up the brokenhearted, that we can be a voice for the voiceless and for the voteless and cause good trouble as all of us can be treated with dignity and, dignity and respect. So we turn this meeting over to you. Lord God, we thank everyone who sought not robbery to give their time and their talent so that we can be a blessing to our cities and our nation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Reverend Reynolds. Uh, this particular group is our de-escalation of violence advocacy forum that we have on Wednesday evenings. And just by way of a very quick update, Congresswoman Gwen Moore is going to introduce a bill in the next two weeks. It is called the National Community Violence De-Escalation Training Act of 2021. We ask all of you to support this bill. If you have members of Congress, people that you work with closely, we need their votes. This bill would provide $500 million of, of funding for organizations to be trained in de-escalation of violence. That means uh, teachers, health professionals, of course, law enforcement, but our emphasis in this bill, and we helped write it, is not the law enforcement, it's the teacher who finds herself looking at a student who's upset with a gun and needs to know how to calm them down. We want the citizens to become experts at de-escalation. So with that, I'd like to introduce the chair of our social action committee, who's going to introduce our special guest this evening. Okay, and Jan Perry is a very special woman. She served for three terms as city councilwoman in the city of Los Angeles. She garners tremendous respect from all parts of the city. And we're just very proud to have her with us as our social action chair. And when she sent me a few notes, she included in this something I didn't realize that she's the second black woman in the history of the 239 years of the city of Los Angeles to be on the city council. Wow, Jan, that is awesome. <laughs> and so thank you for sharing that information. And it really puts everything in quite a perspective. So with that, thank you. Please introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Myers. And actually it's a sad commentary on the city of Los Angeles that it took 239 years and we've only had two black women um, so it is what it is. It means we've got a lot of work to do, but I'm very happy. Um, I'm pleased to uh, have everyone witness this very important discussion uh, tonight with Integrity First for America. I think that we can all agree we are living in very unstable times, um, but the work of this organization for me has given me a lot of hope. And this is the third time that I've participated in a presentation by this group. Now, some of you may remember in August of 2017, neo-Nazis and white supremacists descended on uh, Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia for a weekend of um, violence. Uh, the violence was no accident, it was planned and it was a result of months of planning. 
and it gave us a, a preview of, of the um, uh, domestic terrorism that has followed. Um, Integrity First for America in partnership with world-class lawyers is unique in the sense that they have taken on uh, individuals and hate groups at the center of this very violent movement and have held them accountable in federal court for the violence that they brought to Charlottesville in 2017. Um, report after report underscores the urgency of combating white supremacy and violent extremism in our country. So IFA's work comes at a very critical time. So uh, not only uh, do we have Adina mermelstein Konakop here, but the executive director, Amy Spitalnik, and uh, Amy uh, will be uh, speaking tonight. Um, I just wanna say a few quick words. That Amy is the executive director of the organization, Integrity First for America. It's a nonpartisan civil rights nonprofit supporting the landmark federal lawsuit filed by a coalition of Charlottesville community members against neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and hate groups, all of those who were responsible for the August 2017 violence. And of course, Amy joins IFA with extensive experience in government, politics, advocacy um, throughout uh, the United States. Um, she has uh, highly experienced at all levels of government. She frequently appears in national media and has been awarded a number of fellowships and honors, including being named a Woman in Power Fellow at the 92nd Street Y and a Truman National Security Project Fellow and City and State 40 Under 40. Um, she graduated from Tufts University. Um, and before we get into Amy's words on uh, Amy's discussion, we're gonna have a brief video to take us back to what happened in Charlottesville in 2017. And a uh, warning, it does have some disturbing images and sounds, but it's something I think we need to see. So let's roll with that. Charlottesville. Stark displays of racism. Trying to promote a car has ran into a crowd. Victims thrown in the air. Deadly act of domestic terror. One woman dead. Others killed in the Ten of the people who were injured in Charlottesville, including three of the people who were hit by that car and survived, have now brought a lawsuit against not only the murderer who drove his vehicle into the crowd, but also the leaders of all of the white nationalist groups that organized and promoted the Charlottesville event. We are Integrity First for America. We are here to disrupt the extremism, to interrupt the cycle, to dismantle and bankrupt these hate groups and their leaders, to put them out of business, and most importantly, to stop the violence. Integrity First for America is leading the fight against white supremacy. Our Charlottesville lawsuit is the only current legal effort taking on the broad leadership of this movement, holding white supremacists accountable for their premeditated violence. We know that it's working. They're already facing huge financial and legal consequences. But we also know what we're up against. Bankrupting Nazis isn't cheap. These groups are still recruiting, weaponizing fear, and preparing for their next attack. Now more than ever, we are reminded of our obligation to dismantle the systems of white supremacy that poison this country. Turn your outrage into action. Because hate has no place here. Thank you uh, for the uh, video. So um, Amy, if you would uh, take us back to 2017 and talk about what led up and what actually happened in Charlottesville. Absolutely, and, and thank you so much, Jan, and everyone for, for having me tonight. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, and I wish we were talking about more uplifting topics, but I do think that there is, as dark as this topic can feel, I think there are reasons for hope. And so I'll try to to make that clear as well. 
it's it's easy to forget that almost four years ago in an American city, white supremacists and neo-Nazis were so emboldened, so empowered that they could attack that city and target people based on their race, their religion, their willingness to defend the rights of others. But that's precisely what happened in Charlottesville in August 2017. Um, first, I think many of us remember the feeling of watching neo-Nazis carrying tiki torches, which they specifically chose to evoke the KKK and the Nazis, marching on the University of Virginia, chanting things like Jews will not replace us, blood and soil, white lives matter. They surrounded a small group of peaceful counter-protesters at the Thomas Jefferson statue on campus. They kicked, punched, beat them up, threw fuel and lit torches at them. One of the plaintiffs in our lawsuit, a black undergraduate student um, who's pseudonymous, who's anonymous in our lawsuit because of the threats and violence he's already faced, said he thought he was going to die that night. And nearby an interfaith gathering organized by faith leaders from across Charlottesville had to shelter in place because it was so unsafe outside the doors. Um, ironic because that was intended to be a safe space for the community to come together, knowing white supremacists were coming to town. And of course it too became a target of these extremists. The next day, Saturday, August 12th, I think we all know how the day culminated in the car attack that killed Heather Heyer and injured so many others, as you saw in that video. But I think it's important to understand that it really was a day and a weekend of violence. It was a Saturday, so it was a Shabbat, and the Jewish community was observing Shabbat at synagogue. And these neo-Nazis descended this time on downtown Charlottesville under the guise of protesting the removal of Confederate monuments in what's no, now known as Emancipation Park. Um, before they got to Emancipation Park though, they surrounded the local synagogue where they chanted things like Sieg Heil, talked in their online chats about torching those Jewish monsters. And the synagogue had to evacuate congregants and Torah scrolls out the back and the detail that always sticks with me. Um, and it's particularly, I think, you know, resonant for me, I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors is that the synagogue was home to a Torah scroll saved from Nazi Germany decades ago. And in America in 2017, it was once again under Nazi threat. And that just sort of guts me every time I, I share that story or read it in our lawsuit. These neo-Nazis and white supremacists also specifically targeted the black neighborhoods in Charlottesville where they drove these white Mercedes vans through the neighborhoods, terrorizing the community even days after the violence downtown ended. Um, the violence continued throughout the week, throughout the day rather. They charged a line of interfaith clergy as you also saw in that video which included one of our plaintiffs, Reverend Seth Wispoway, a number of other faith leaders like Cornell West and others. And ultimately the day culminated in a car attack in which James Fields drove his car into a crowd of peaceful counter protesters, killing Heather Heyer, injuring so many others like our plaintiffs, Marcus Martin, Marissa Blair, Natalie Romero, and others that you saw in that video. And what's important to understand is that nothing that happened in Charlottesville that weekend was an accident, but rather it was meticulously planned for months in advance on social media, down to discussions of whether they could hit protesters with cars and then claim self-defense, which was the topic of their online chats just a few weeks before Unite the Right um, in mid-July of 2017. And so that's not an accident. That's not a clash between different sides. That's a racist, violent conspiracy. And we have laws that are meant to protect against those sorts of conspiracies. And we're using those laws to take to court the two dozen individuals and hate groups responsible for that conspiracy on behalf of a coalition of Charlottesville community members who were injured. Okay. Um, so tell us more about the case that is the epicenter of our discussion tonight. And I think the name it's scenes or is it signs? Signs, so, yeah. Signs versus Kessler. And how did it come about and, and why does it matter? And in, in that context, tell us about the plaintiffs. Absolutely. I think, you know, I think many of us watched what happened in Charlottesville and we're both horrified and had a feeling that what happened needed something needed to be done. And I think it was very clear to many of us that the Department of Justice at the time, which was led by Jeff Sessions, was unlikely to pursue civil rights work with any enthusiasm, to put it very lightly. Um, of course, the stats have since borne this out. We know that civil rights investigations mm -hmm. and prosecutions during the Trump era were down two thirds compared to the Obama era. Um, and so we know that there was a big gap there and that it was incredibly unlikely, particularly when President Trump called them fine people on both sides, that the Department of Justice was going to do its job here. Um, and so that meant that there was a vacuum, there was a gap. 
um, and that there needed to be someone holding accountable those responsible for what happened. Within days of the violence, um, a, a site known as Unicorn Riot, which is a nonprofit journalism website, was able to publish leaked chats from those Discord social media chats where the violence was planned. And in the days after Charlottesville, those chats came out and it became very clear what we now know and what and the, what the basis of our lawsuit is, is that this violence was planned meticulously in advance from the mundane and banal. So they talked about what to wear, what to bring for lunch, how do you best sew a swastika onto a flag to the violin, the violent, how to use supposed free speech instruments like flagpoles as weapons, um, and how whether they could hit protesters with cars and claim self-defense, as I mentioned earlier. And so it was very clear that there was a conspiracy here that happened, that the violence wasn't simply an organic, a uh, natural result of a clash between two sides as some of the extremists claim, but rather planned and intended for that weekend. Um, and so within days, our some of our attorneys, including our lead attorney, Robbie Kaplan, who some of you might know because she represented Edie Windsor in the fight that uh, at the Supreme Court that struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, um, were on the ground in Charlottesville meeting with a number of community members and others who had been injured in the violence. Um, and many of those people have now become the plaintiffs in our lawsuit, people who you saw in that video who I mentioned, like Marcus Martin, who in, in that iconic Pulitzer winning photo of the car going through the crowd, you see Marcus sort of splayed across the back in his red sneakers and white tank top. His then fiance, now wife Marissa, who he had pushed out of the way just as the car was coming through, likely saving her life, but both were uh, very grievously injured. Marcus's legs were shattered. Marissa suffered a number of injuries. Natalie Romero, whose skull was fractured in the attack. Reverend Seth Whispleway, who uh, was attacked violently by these white supremacists as he was peacefully marching with other faith leaders. Liz Sines, um, who was a UVA University of Virginia law student and was violently attacked on campus during the Tiki Torch March on Friday night and also happened to be in the crowd that was attacked with the car on Saturday and talks about the trauma she still has uh, and how she can no longer be in crowds in addition to, of course, the injuries she sustained. Um, and so many others like John Doe, who is anonymous, a pseudonymous plaintiff in our case, um, a black undergrad at the University of Virginia who was who received so many threats and so, so much saw so much violence from these white supremacists that he was afraid to put his name on this lawsuit and, and did so anonymously. Um, and the plaintiffs really are the bravest people I know. They took this awful thing that they survived, that they lived through, and they decided to channel it into this lawsuit, which is really the only legal effort seeking to hold accountable the broader leadership of the white supremacist movement in America, and of course, the, the leaders that were most directly responsible for what happened. The lawsuit itself is, is fairly straightforward in the sense that what happened was not an accident. It was a racist, violent conspiracy. It was planned meticulously in advance as those online chats and other evidence show. And we have laws that are meant to protect against that. Most notably a law known as the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which is 150 years old and was first passed during the reconstruction era to protect recently freed slaves from Klan violence in the South, as these Klansmen would use violence and harassment to seek to undermine recently won 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment rights. It's been used a handful of times since, including during moments of resurgent Klan violence like the early 1900s and during the Freedom Rider era. Um, and we are using it here to hold accountable the white supremacists who conspire to bring violence to Charlottesville. Um, there's so much to say about the case, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more and, and uh, throughout the course of our conversation. Um, but the simple upshot in terms of where it stands and um, and sort of its its strength is that, as you can imagine, many of the defendants have tried to avoid accountability, have tried to have this case dismissed. The court has rejected every effort by the defendants to avoid accountability. They rejected the defendants' motions to dismiss in a really strong decision in summer of 2018 that made clear um, their arguments don't hold, that the First Amendment does not protect violence, that the Second Amendment doesn't protect what they did, and so on. And we are now scheduled for trial in this October in federal court in Charlottesville. Can you talk a little bit more about the defendants and how you you 
located them, you know, because I'm sure extremists, you know, like, they don't have a board of directors on letterhead, <laughs> you know, so how, how do you find them? Uh, that's a great assets? question. Yeah. And so first and foremost, I would say it was important that we really identified who the ringleaders were of what happened in Charlottesville. As, as many of us know, there were hundreds of extremists in Charlottesville. We specifically wanted to go after those most directly responsible for orchestrating and, and executing the violence. And through those social media chats and the other evidence that came out in the aftermath of Unite the Right, we were able to identify who those people are. We're not just going after the random guy who drove down to Charlottesville and simply marched with a tiki torch. We're going after the individuals and groups who specifically orchestrated the violence, who planned in those social media chats for there to be violence, who recruited people, who talked about weaponry and other tactics that they would use, and then who helped execute that violence in Charlottesville on August 11th and 12th. And so it was most important that we identify those people, um, which we were able to do largely from those chats that came out in the aftermath. Um, and then, of course, we filed suit in October of 2017, two months after Unite the Right. Um, we were able to file so quickly because of that lucky break we had with the leaked Discord chats. Um, but as you can imagine, it was not easy to serve some of these defendants. Some defendants still continue to sort of be on the lam and be hiding out. Um, like one defendant who goes by Robert Asmador Ray, who actually has a bench warrant out for his arrest in our case because of his failure to comply with court orders. Um, and when he is located by the marshals, will be thrown in jail, um, which is pretty rare in a civil case like ours, but a testament to sort of how flagrantly these defendants have tried to violate court orders. Um, but unsurprisingly, the defendants in our lawsuit not only are responsible for orchestrating the violence in Charlottesville four years ago, but really are at the center of the broader white supremacist movement in America. I suspect many of you will know their names, people like Richard Spencer, who's one of the leading neo-Nazis in this country, Andrew Anglin, who runs the Daily Stormer, which is one of the leading white supremacist neo-Nazi websites, Vanguard America, which is the white supremacist group that James Fields was in Charlottesville with, certain Klan groups, League of the South, which is a, a neo-Confederate group they call themselves, which is just another term for white supremacist, um, and a whole host of other leaders and groups um, who have deep and disturbing connections to the broader white supremacist movement. I think you will be unsurprised by the fact that, for example, the Pittsburgh shooter who killed 11 people at a synagogue two and a half years ago, communicated with some of the Charlottesville leaders before his attack. The Christ Church shooter who killed dozens of Muslims praying in two mosques in New Zealand two years ago donated to two of our defendants and painted onto his gun a white power symbol that was popularized by another defendant in our lawsuit. And Christ Church was live streamed on Facebook and in turn inspired the Poe white supremacist attack on a synagogue there, the El Paso Walmart attack, which specifically targeted the Latinx community. And of course, many of our defendants and their supporters also revere Dylan Roof, uh, who was and his bowl cut, they have this whole idea of uh, this sort of like bowl cut army that they call themselves revering the Charleston shooting at a black church there in, um, in I believe 2015. And so you really see how the defendants in our lawsuit are at the center of this movement and how each attack is used to inspire the next one. So the theory of change in our case is a fairly simple one by going after the leaders and groups at the center of this movement and holding them accountable in court, winning large financial judgments against them through a civil suit like ours, we can effectively bankrupt, disrupt and dismantle the leaders at the center of this movement and have an impact that goes well beyond Charlottesville, but makes clear the consequences for the sort of racist violent conspiracy for the entire movement. What's their response in court and what sort of lawyers tend to represent them? Yeah, the people who represent them are exactly who you would expect. In fact, one of the main lawyers representing a, a sort of a, a group of the defendants literally bills himself as Nazi lawyer. And he has said he's taken on this case to deal with, quote, the Jewish influence in our society. Um, he is, of course, ideologically aligned with them. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the defendants are representing themselves, some because they chose to, others because they have lost representation because their behavior has been, to quote one of their former attorneys, so repugnant that even their lawyers can't represent them, like the threats they make against us and our legal team. Um, and so it has really been extraordinary 
um, watching sort of this unfold. Um, their response has been what you would expect as well, trying to avoid accountability at every turn. So they filed a number of motions to dismiss, which were roundly rejected by the court. Um, they have tried to say, some have tried to say they're bankrupt and they can't face liability in this case, which the court rejected. Some have tried to block subpoenas into social media companies for their chats, which the courts have also blocked. Many have flagrantly ignored court orders requiring them to turn over phones, computers, social media, and email accounts, um, in which case the court has granted sort of an increasing amount of sanctions and penalties against them. Some have faced five-figure financial penalties as a result of violating court orders. For example, last year we won um, over $41,000 in sanctions against three key defendants. Two have had bench warrants issued for their arrest, and one has already sat in jail for contempt of court, and the other one, Ray, Robert Ray, is uh, on the run, but when he is picked up by the marshals, will also sit in jail. And now our team is winning what's called evidentiary sanctions or adverse inferences, which are pretty rare for anyone who's a lawyer on this call, fairly rare to win adverse inferences in civil litigation. A number of our attorneys who have been practicing for decades have said that they have tried very hard to win adverse inferences in prior cases and have not been able to. The fact that we've won three adverse inference rulings in this case already is, important, is, is sort of a testament to how egregiously the defendants have behaved. And what this means is that at trial this fall, the judge will instruct the jury to treat as an established fact that these defendants, uh, in, for example, in the case of one of our defendants, Elliot Klein, specifically conspired to commit racist violence in Charlottesville, which is the core allegation of our lawsuit. So that's already a key established fact that we've already won against him even before trial. Um, and more broadly, the jury will be instructed to draw a negative inference, a negative, in, uh, an adverse inference from the fact that these defendants have withheld or destroyed evidence in the case, um, which will be enormously powerful for the jury to hear as they, um, as they consider this case. So you started contextualizing how Charlottesville fits into this larger far-right extremist activity across the country. And then you also referenced uh, Tree of Life. And I think Dr. Myers would probably say that the rabbi from that synagogue is also a member of our group. Um, can you connect the dots for us from one coast to the other uh, in what this means in terms of a national agenda that you've been able to observe based on your litigation? Absolutely. I think, you know, this has been alluded to already by a number of folks, but I think it's clear that we're facing a crisis right now. And it's not just these anecdotes. I think if you look at the at the events over the last few years, Charleston, Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, Powell, Paso, the capital, clearly anecdotally, we all know that we're facing a crisis of extremism in this country. But the stats, the statistics, unfortunately, also back that up in very real ways. The FBI says that 2019 was the deadliest year on record for hate crimes in America. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security under Donald Trump said that white supremacy is, quote, the most pervasive and lethal threat to this country. Um, domestic extremism, domestic terror is at record levels, the highest ever level since 1995, which was the year of the Oklahoma City bombing, um, another white supremacist attack, of course, many years ago at this point. Um, and so every statistic affirms what we know to be true, that we are facing a crisis of extremism in America, that the gravest threat to our security right now is domestic extremism, specifically domestic extremism from the far right, including and especially white supremacists. And so all of the stats point to that in addition to what we're all seeing and experiencing in communities around this country. Um, of course, there have been efforts by white supremacists and by political leaders to distract and deflect from that, to try to whitewash what's happening. And perhaps most recently, the fact that there couldn't even be bipartisan agreement on an independent commission to look at what happened on January 6th at the Capitol is another sad testament to how some of this extremism has been mainstreamed, how the ways in which these conspiracy theories, these extremist ideologies are becoming an increasingly mainstream part of our political discourse. Um, and Charlottesville in so many ways really served as the preview, as the harbinger of that. Um, it's, of course, this movement has evolved over the last four years, but the ways in which the Charlottesville playbook, the use of social media to recruit, to plan and orchestrate and organize violence, the white supremacist conspiracies at the core of what we saw there, this idea of 
the re replacement theory. When you hear extreme, uh, these white supremacists chant things like Jews will not re replace us that speak to a very specific ideology. This idea that that all the progress that we've seen for the black community, for the brown communities, for immigrants, refugees in America, that that couldn't have happened on their own, that somehow those communities are not capable of achieving those things on their own, including, for example, the first black president or the fact that the Black Lives Matter protests last summer were so successful in sort of helping to shape a national conversation on racial injustice. These white supremacists don't can't possibly fathom that those things could have happened on their own. There has to be someone in the background pulling the strings. And like with so many conspiracy theories, they specifically believe that it's the Jews. And so these conspiracy theories have the benefit of being both racist and anti-Semitic and really underscore, I think, how deeply intertwined communities' fates are here. That you really can't take on white supremacy without taking on the anti-Semitism at its core. And you can't take on anti-Semitism without taking on the racism and white supremacy that's inextricably linked with it through these sorts of conspiracy theories. And it's that sort of ideology that has really permeated so much of not just the, the larger scale attacks and violence that we've seen, Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, Powell, El Paso, and so on, but also increasingly some of the uh, sort of more subtle ways in which it manifests. When you hear, for example, Tucker Carlson on primetime TV talking about the white white communities being replaced, effectively espousing the same ideology. When you hear conspiracies about George Soros supposedly funding the Black Lives Matter protests or funding a caravan coming up from Central America, that all harkens back to the same conspiracy theory and it's meant to further the same sort of extremism in a variety of different ways and illustrate how this extremism has become an increasingly mainstream part of our political discourse at a moment when we already know we're facing crisis level violence and extremism. So tell me this then. So uh, obviously the case has had an impact on the people who are, are, are the defendants in this case, but uh, January 6th took place after this case was filed. And I don't know if there was a, a center to the leadership and in the insurrection at the Capitol, but what, what do you think of this case in terms of the long range implications uh, for people who believe in, and I may get the names, but deep state and somebody's pulling the strings and all those other crazy conspiracy theories. Look, I think, and maybe I'm cynical, but I don't believe we'll ever eradicate hate or fully eradicate extremism or conspiracies. But what we can do is make clear the consequences for being a part of these conspiracies make clear the consequences for participating in these acts of violence. And our case, alongside other accountability and other measures, including a number of the measures that were talked about earlier in the anti-violence space, including action that we need to see from all levels of our government, from the private sector and social media companies, um, our case can play a critical role in the broader landscape of what needs to be done to make clear the consequences for extremism and to push it back into the shadows where it belongs as opposed to having it out on the streets targeting people in our churches and our synagogues and our mosques and our stores and our communities. And so we are already seeing the impact this case is having on the defendants. We've had defendants like Richard Spencer complain that it's financially crippling. Some defendants have, as I mentioned, have already faced large financial and other legal consequences. And many have said they're not going to, they, they decline to participate in subsequent uh, events, you know, like mm. Unite the Right 3.0, because they don't want to be sued again. And so if we as a small nonprofit can effectively financially cripple the leaders of the neo-Nazi movement in America and create this deterrent effect, imagine what would happen if the full power of our Department of Justice and other entities were used to finally hold these extremists accountable after years in which they were let off the hook over and over again. And so we're starting to see that in the aftermath of January 6th, where there's been over 400 cases brought against the insurrectionists, and we're seeing the impact that has, and that certainly has had a deterrent effect. Um, but it, of course, it needs to be part of a much larger effort. Uh, litigation, criminal charges alone aren't going to solve this, this crisis. We can't simply sue our way out of extremism in America. We need to use it as one tool to make clear the consequences, but we also need to make sure that social media companies are living up to their obligations here. 
there's no First Amendment obligation for any private company to give space to extremism online. And that's true of both the sites that have built business models on extremism, like Telegram and Gab and 4chan and 8chan, but also the mainstream sites that we all use that have been far too lax in giving a pass to extremism. It's true of not just our federal government that has an obligation to finally treat this with the urgency it deserves, but also state and local governments who need to make sure that they're effectively prosecuting hate crimes and holding those accountable who are targeting communities. And it also, of course, means making sure that while we use the justice system to seek accountability in a case like this, we're also working and striving to fix our justice system so that it works more equitably and fairly for everyone and doesn't perpetuate the same systems of white supremacy that this is all part and parcel of. And so mm -hmm. I think there's, of course, a much broader uh, comprehensive approach that we need to take on extremism in this country, but one key piece of the puzzle is to make clear the importance of accountability and the ways in which our suit has already sort of emerged as a model for that has been heartening and I hope will continue to encourage others um, from in the government and in the private space to, to seek similar accountability where appropriate. Thank you. So Dr. Myers, why don't we open this up to questions from people who are participating in the discussion tonight? I think she's there. All right, hold on. Can you hear me? Okay, did I lose her? Oh, there she is. Here I am. Uh, Dr. Myers, I think you had a question before I started. Um, okay, I did, I did have a question. Um, when we have people in jail, when they get out of jail or when they're in jail, we try to provide them with something to change their behavior in the case of violence. Is there anything designed to help these people who have been brainwashed with racism for generations and this white supremacist ignorance? Is there any kind of um, approach or system or education that these people can be exposed to that can help them understand that what they're believing in is just brainwashing? Yes, absolutely. There's there's a few different things I'll say on this front. I think, because there's different levels here, right? There are some people who simply are, are being, are, are not being educated. And, you know, ironically, this, this insane debate that we're having in this country right now about whether we should be teaching critical race theory in schools, which of course, no school is actually really teaching critical race theory. We're just having schools that are trying to teach our history with without the whitewashing that many of us experienced growing up, or at least I did growing up in the public school system. Um, so I think first and foremost, making sure that our schools are teaching our history in full with, a, with eyes wide open to what this country's history actually is and not whitewashing the white supremacy that has been part of this country since the start is, is crucial to making sure we're educating people in a way uh, that that doesn't send them down uh, the, the sort of rabbit hole of radicalization to begin with, but many will still be tempted by that. And so I think there's a few other things that need to happen. First, there's groups like Life After Hate that does important work helping to keep people out of uh, the out of that rabbit hole of radicalization to begin with, and then once they are radicalized, working to pull them out. Um, there, so I think there are important leaders there. There are many sort of grifters, if you will, in that space, including some of our own defendants who claim that they're magically reformed after being sued for their actions a couple years ago, who say they're now working to de-radicalize people. And by all means, if they want to actually leave the movement and take tangible steps to de-radicalize and help others, great. Um, but we need to actually make sure that if we're going to promote and support efforts, organizations that are doing work in the space, they're credible. And so Life After Hate is one of them. That's one of the credible organizations. Just a few weeks ago, President Biden signed a bill. Um, specifically, it was the it was a COVID-19 hate crimes bill. And a part of that was um, a, the No Hate Act, which is named after a number of victims of hate crimes, including Heather Heyer, who was killed in Charlottesville. And among the many components of that bill is an effort specifically to, um, to uh, add non-carceral solutions to people who are um, involved with hate crimes to make sure that um, for, for people who are either coming out of prison um, for hate crimes related cases or um, are, you know, the a judge is considering sentencing, 
can offer more educational and engagement related solutions to help uh, help make sure we're actually educating people who are involved with hate crimes. Um, there's so much more that needs to be done in the space. I do think social media plays a critical role um, because so many people when they click on one, for example, hate group on Facebook, all of a sudden are served ads for 12 more groups that are in that same vein and making sure that we're not allowing people to be radicalized through online algorithms, which have made it far easier for them to go down that rabbit hole than before is so crucial. And so there are also efforts and unique uh, programs, including efforts to sort of redirect people if they're searching for white supremacist terms online in partnership with Google and other organizations. And I think we need to be investing in and exploring solutions like that too, given how many people, particularly younger people are online and the ways in which social media has really served as um, in many ways, the clandestine of the 21st century in, in giving, in creating a space for these extremists to come together. And so it really requires a comprehensive approach I'm heartened by some of, by this recent bill that was signed by President Biden, that bill we've supported for a while, uh, and, and some of these organizations that are doing important work, and I hope that they continue to be um, built upon and supported to, to make sure that this isn't simply, uh, we're not simply prosecuting our way out of this problem, but looking for those education and engagement related solutions too. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, I'm fascinated. Um, about your presentation and uh, your passion for what you're doing. And so I wanted to know what, what brought you into this field, into this organization? Um, that's the, the, the first question. Second, I'd like to know, how are you funded and um, uh, in comparison to, to who is funding these, these white supremacist group? Are they, is the funds coming in your way or their uh, equal to what's going to the other group. And the third question, you know, we can get to it, you know, from, from the way I see it, that these groups now are emboldened, you know, uh, they have friends in Congress. Um, they can say that they are patriots and they came and they were able to to almost bring down the, the, the capital. Um, don't they have a sense now of, of being more powerful than, than ever because of what they did on January 6th? Yeah, I'll start with the last one. I wholeheartedly agree. I think that certainly, you know, these, I don't wanna say that extremism started and stopped with Trump, which is a misperception. I think, I think many people think that now that Trump is no longer in office, these extremists are going away. And certainly the last few months has made clear that they're not. Um, and, but I will say they were, of course, particularly emboldened and empowered under Trump. And in the aftermath of things like Charlottesville, when they were told there were fine people, or when at the debate in October, the uh, then president told them to stand back and stand by, those are all comments that, uh, that continue to embolden and empower these extremists in a way that has not happened or existed for very long time in this country. And so I think it's important to be clear-eyed about this. Um, and I think, I, you know, some of us were talking before the, the formal program started, and I think that there is a unique moment that we're in right now that uh, I mentioned Dr. Ibram Kendi, who compared this moment in many ways to the Reconstructionist era, where there's been both enormous progress on a number of fronts, including, for example, our first Black president and the public reckoning that we're finally having on racial justice in this country. And then the natural backlash to that is the rise in extremism and hate that we're seeing. And I think we need to be forceful in making clear it has no place here in a variety of ways, not just through the courts, but through the various other tools and tactics that I mentioned. So I sort of wholeheartedly agree that they are especially emboldened and empowered in this moment. But I also think that we have a unique opportunity to make clear um, the consequences for this sort of violent hate. Um, to the other two questions, uh, what brought me to this? And, and thank you for those questions. Um, I, in my prior life, I worked in government and politics, most recently in the New York Attorney General's office. And in that role, um, well, we, we were very busy during the Trump era, as you could imagine, 
on a number of different fronts from the Muslim ban to a whole host of other assaults on people's civil rights and civil liberties. Um, and in the course of that work, I met an attorney named Roberta Kaplan, who I mentioned earlier, who um, was very engaged in the civil rights space. And when she had this idea for the Charlottesville lawsuit, she approached me and asked if I would be interested in working with her to support this, to bring this across, to make sure it was it was supported, it was resourced. It, um, and when someone calls you up and says, do you wanna help me sue Nazis? It's hard to say no to that. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivor. So it was particularly resonant and powerful for me. Um, and so, uh, I came on as, as the executive director of, of this organization, Integrity First for America, and we were founded with the intent to help fill those gaps in public interest litigation and the civil rights work that it was clear the Department of Justice was not going to do under the Trump era. Um, and, uh, and this case is the centerpiece of our work. It's too important, it's too large, it's too resource intensive for us to be trying to do a bunch of different cases at, at once. So really it is the centerpiece of our work and everything we raise, everything we do is in support of this case right now. To, so to your other question about funding, um, the defendants absolutely fundraise. In fact, they're in the midst of a big fundraising push right now and a number of larger uh, white supremacist podcasts and other leaders continue to host fundraisers for them, including um, just today, we put out an email to our list about how um, one of the white supremacist leader, one of the white supremacist defendants in our case was on a podcast talking about how they hope to whitewash what happened in Charlottesville um, and make sure that it doesn't become another Selma, that it doesn't become another symbol of racial injustice in America. And obviously our goal with this lawsuit is not just to hold them accountable to me, but to make sure that the facts of what happened in Charlottesville are clear and established and told in court, which our lawsuit does and not let them win the day on whitewashing what happened. So they're certainly raising money from their vast online network of extremists um, and in a variety of ways. We are, of course, aggressively raising money too. The legal work in this case is donated generously by incredible attorneys um, across five different firms who have been working on this case. But there are major expenses, security being frankly the biggest expense because of the threats and the harassment against us, our plaintiffs, our lawyers, directly from the defendants and from many of their supporters. Um, evidence collection, so literally scraping the evidence off of the defendants' phones, computers, social media, and email accounts is quite expensive. And then, of course, trial itself. We're going to be in Charlottesville for trial for weeks at a time, and there are logistics around that. Deposition, transcripts, process servers, all sorts of different out-of-pocket costs that exist in litigation like this. Um, and so we have been quite aggressive in raising money. I've been very heartened by the support we've received. We're, we're a 501c3, so we're not for profit. Everything is tax deductible. And I've been heartened to really, you know, everyone from who donates $5 a month to five, six figure donations has been really just so incredibly heartening to see that support come in from around the country. Um, and uh, if, if folks are interested in supporting this, please know that it directly supports the lawsuit and specifically those costs that I mentioned. Um, and that of course it is, uh, we are a nonpartisan tax deductible charitable organization. And so, so let me just say to everybody on the call, anybody who wants to you know, be on the list, put your emails in the chat uh, so that uh, Adina can take them uh, and we can stay in touch. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please, no, no, please. So Dr. Myers, let's see, I can't see, are there other questions? Oh, great, the emails are rolling in. You know where to find me. <laughs> are there other questions from the group? Um, yeah, this is uh, past movie and unfortunately I'm going to have to leave. Uh, since uh, we have a new administration, have you experienced a more uh, welcoming and more support from the Department of Justice? And uh, it seems like the tide have turned in a, in, toward our favor since we have a new administration. Yeah, yeah I 100% agree. It's, it's certainly not perfect. Nothing is perfect. There's a lot that I want to see, there's more that I want to see from this Department of Justice, but it's like night and day from, from what we had beforehand. And I will say I'm particularly excited that just a few weeks ago, the Senate finally confirmed Kristen Clark to lead 
the Civil Rights Division. She's a former colleague of mine from the New York AG's office. She's a brilliant attorney who led the Civil Rights Division in our office in New York and then led the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Um, and she is finally confirmed to lead the Civil Rights Division at DOJ. And I suspect we'll see a lot more out of that division. Pam Carlin, who's her deputy there, is another fantastic attorney who we work closely with. Um, and so it's I, I'm particularly excited about her, about Vanita Gupta, who has a strong history of, of civil rights and taking on extremism. And there's already been over 400 cases brought against the Capitol insurrectionists, including some of the first plea deals that we saw over the last few weeks. Um, I am optimistic that we'll see a lot more from this DOJ. And of course, I know we and others, including perhaps some of you, will also keep pushing to hold them accountable and make sure that we continue to see what we need to see in terms of treating extremism with the urgency it deserves. But the people that they've put in place um, are really, especially Kristen and Vanita, are, are some of the best on this front. And I'm very excited um, to see what they do in their roles. How else can we well, That's you? good. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Pastor, go ahead. But I, I, listen, that's great news, I gotta leave. And then also um, I will be in touch and see how we can build greater partnerships and raising the awareness within the different communities that's impacted, especially the African-American community, and see how we can partner and support one another because this is an attack on all of us. And, you Thank know. you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you asked, Jen asked what else folks can do. I think, you know, of course, if, if you're able to donate, that's wonderful, but it's not the only thing you can do. I think we're eager to get out the word and let people know that this is happening, particularly as we get ready for trial. For trial. It's really easy to feel helpless and hopeless on this issue in this moment. I get that. This is a concrete, tangible way to take action against white supremacy and extremism at such a dark moment on this front. And so... Uh, and so if you, you know, want to host a session for an organization you're involved with for your, uh, for your church or synagogue or other house of worship, um, we would love to work with you and Adina, who is here specifically coordinates all of our community engagement work. Um, and I think our, her info is in chat or will be in chat in addition to a variety of other links um, and would love to uh, work with you to continue to build out programming and partnership to make sure people know that this is happening and that there's a concrete, tangible way to hold these extremists accountable. Dr. Myers, can you um, uh, update us? Do we have anything already on our agenda for um, <clears throat> the month of nonviolence? Do we have anything that we can fit this a session to give some visibility to this and Wait, even no we have not got anything in october uh amy we have the month of <coughs> families nonviolence, and opportunities mm -hmm. the entire month of october and we are scheduling events to promote public awareness of violence prevention and a whole range of other things so dr dunston mm -hmm. is asking a very good question about whether we need to look at perhaps doing something and also mm -hmm. Reverend Rose Murray is on the call. I believe she was on, yeah, she's on. She's the co-chair of our uh, faith committee. Maybe there's something uh, Reverend Murray, we can talk about later to have our faith uh, organization post something with Amy and with the organization. That would be in the fall. Now you guys go to court when, in September? When but as of right now, October 25th, um, <laughs> so. so uh, but late enough in October that we could still work with you all on something earlier in the month. And, uh, and certainly, you know, we will be all hands doing whatever we can to get out the word in the lead up to trial. Well, we can be creative and see how we can, <clears throat> since October is our month <laughs> uh, that we're celebrating, whether we can come up with something where we can frame something around what's going on right there. And, exactly. make, and make that part of an intention getter. Uh, uh, I was just wondering, um, uh, Dr. Myers, do you know of any chapters or contacts in Charlottesville or close to that area that we might even make a connection to try to do some PR in this regard? Not at this time, no. Mm -hmm. We work closely with particularly the faith community in Charlottesville. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I suspect there might be connections there, 
including folks who might be involved in the various in mm -hmm. organizations represented here without us even knowing. Yeah. Uh, just because it's, I mean, Charlottesville is such an incredible community and such a diverse community. Mm. And that's one of the reasons it was targeted by these extremists because of, mm. of how progressively minded it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I suspect that there are some folks involved with a number of the organizations represented here, even if we don't know it um, and, and can certainly help connect the dots mm -hmm. as well, if, uh, including uh, with folks directly in Charlottesville. Right. Well, Amy, I, you know, we've partnered with organizations. So let's let's do like Dr. Dunstan yeah. suggesting and we can partner. We partner with Moms Demand Action, with yeah, 100 yeah. Fathers, with various yeah. groups that we connect with. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this time we might even see how we might even partner <laughs> with you for a fundraising tied activity around this time as well. Mm -hmm. Well, we would one. be grateful and love to partner with you however works. Yeah. I think we can explore that. And also, uh, as Dr. Meyer said, we have the faith-based group uh, that's already engaged and they have a couple of Sunday already planned Sundays to really highlight this in the Sunday message during that month. And so uh, we can certainly begin to explore how we might uh, be able to uh, uh, overlay this. Maybe Dr. Reynolds, uh, who hears our uh, certainly, uh, who's our chaplain, and very familiar with that. But we'll, we'll continue to explore it. That's that's. I would, but an excellent presentation, yeah. excellent presentation, very informative, and also heartwarming. Where are you from, young lady? Where are you I'm from? I'm from New York. You're from, okay. Yeah. Okay. My accent comes out when I get <laughs> worked up. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so One much. One thing I wanted to ask before we leave, do you have any information? Because this is like what, and everybody is subtle on this question about August. Uh, President Trump has said he will be reinstated in August. And we know that he gives out message uh, about what is going to happen. Has anybody thought about that? Yeah, I think, you know, we, it's, it, that seems part and parcel of the broader conspiracies. Right. And others can, it's similar to stand back and stand by. And it's all meant to yes. work all these extremists to action and give them something to feel like they're fighting for. Or, so it makes, it makes holding these extremists accountable all the more important. And of course, it makes preventing these extremists from taking action all the more crucial. Um, and I think in particular, making sure that we've learned the lessons of January 6th and of Charlottesville and are holding our elected officials, our law enforcement, others to account for, for protecting us in those moments. And also, of course, rooting out the connections between these extremists um, and law enforcement, which is an unfortunate reality. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I think it's just another tool that Trump uses to try to rile these extremists to action, and it's disturbing and horrific. And we need to be doing everything we can to make clear how discredited it all is. Okay. I have a question. Um, that's fantastic presentation. Wonderful, wonderful information. Thank you for all of the work that you all are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like you said, it's a multi-pronged approach that we have to use to smash, you know, white supremacy, that extremism thinking. But to what extent do you think that dialogue, not just like on a national level, like with these dignitaries and stuff like that, I'm talking about people to people in the neighborhoods, in the communities, like just dialogue will help because we all know that there is extremism, but then there's just plain old racism. And then there's, it, we're strained because we have gentrification taking place. And that's like a, causing a lot of tension. A lot is it just a lot of things. So to what extent do you think that would be an effective, like to have a real heart to heart conversations and dialogue? I think it works in some cases. I think it's like education. Um, and I think they go hand in hand. I think the I think they they all chip away at the effectiveness of these extremists' ability to recruit. 
I don't think we're going to eradicate hate. I don't think we're going to fully eradicate extremism. But I think what we can do is make it harder for them to recruit in a variety of ways by educating people, by making sure they know that the people they supposedly are being told to hate by these extremists are their neighbors, their colleagues, their friends, and getting to know them on a human level by of course, also making it harder for them to recruit through limiting their social media reach by showing the consequences for their action. All of these are tools to make it harder for them to spread their hate and spread their violence. There will always be those who seek to promote it, but we can make it a lot harder for them and push them back into the shadows where they belong. And so I think all of it has value in different ways. And one of the things that's been most heartening about our work is that, for example, a couple of days ago, I did an event with the Atlanta community and we had um, Reverend Vaughn, who is the preacher at the Ebenezer Church, where MLK and uh, Senator Warnock used to preach alongside Jewish leaders, alongside a whole host of other leaders, and seeing faith communities come together around the fight against white supremacy and extremism is has been the, the most heartening part of this job for me. Um, and I think it's enormously powerful because it also illustrates that all of our fates are deeply intertwined here, that you can't take on one form of hate without taking on the others. And there, are, white supremacists want to pit communities against each other. We want to pit the black and the Jewish and the Muslim and other communities against one another. And by making clear that our fates are, are inextricably linked, uh, it can help make it a lot harder for them to do that. Mm -hmm. Our organization is Thank very you. dedicated to interfaith. Yes. Uh, Rabbi Myers from the Tree of Life Synagogue uh, Imam Talib Sharif, who's yeah. near the nation's mosque here in D.C. We have a, a broad group of Christian leaders, uh, Buddhists. You know, we, we really strongly believe in the interfaith approach to, uh, to, to public policy and civic engagement. Wholeheartedly agree and grateful for that. Interfaith yeah, and multicultural. And even though our name is Black Women for Positive Change, we have a whole bunch of men who belong and a whole bunch of folks who are not black, which is obvious tonight. <laughs> I love it. Any other questions, Dr. Myers? I just open it up to the group. No, I, I think it's been an excellent session. And mm, thank excellent. you, Amy, for, uh, for Thank your you all so much for having me and, and looking forward to the time that we could do this in person in some way. <laughs> and thanks, Adina, for putting it all together, doing yes. all the logistics. Yeah, did a great job. And Amy, thank you. <laughs> And it's been a great conversation. I'm really glad everybody got on tonight. Uh, I had to smile a little bit when Reverend Bowie said he had to go because he always has to go for Bible study. Um, so, you know, you can't argue with that. Glad he was with us. But take a look at October and you guys look at a date and see what works mm -hmm. for you. And yeah. you want to do a forum, we mm -hmm. can certainly try to, you know, with enough yeah. time help to, to do yes. it. So you can yeah. select some of the speakers because you know around the country who the real skilled presenters would be. And I would think that a weeknight would be about right. You could make it on a Wednesday night, Great. just a part of this group, but we'll just have more time and reach out and try to get a crowd out. Perfect. Well, we will absolutely be in touch. And if anyone else has thoughts or ideas or ways to partner, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to, to work with everyone. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Grateful to all of you for Thank taking you. time tonight. We always close our meetings the way we start them, and that is with a prayer. So Reverend Murray, I'm gonna throw the ball to you. Reverend uh, Reynolds opened us up. So if you would be so kind as to uh, close us, sorry for the last minute request. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we come in the blessed name of Jesus. We come saying thank you for this meeting and for the information that was imparted to us, dear God. We're asking, dear God, that we can work cohesively, dear God, and that work can be done and the outcome can be established. Dear God, we thank you for all of those that's on the meeting tonight, the presenter, dear God. We thank you for her work, dear God. And yeah. please, dear God, help her in her endeavors, dear God, to make this safe. country, to make our lives more safer, dear God. But we thank you, dear God, for mm -hmm. lifting all these things up, dear God, and making us aware of what you have for us mm. in store. Amen. Help us to be more kind, help us to be more loving, and help us to be on your side. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.
Thank you, Reverend. Okay. okay. Well, thanks, to everyone. All Thank right. You. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. We'll be in Take touch, care. Uh, Dr. Myers. <laughs> good night. Okay. Maria, will you be able to cut?